Hi, this is Next Generation Assessment. I'm here with my co-host, uh, Tammy Cumming. And um, just uh, today, we're uh, going to be talking a little bit about the I Iowa Writers um, Workshop. And so uh, just a little bit about myself. I'm, I'm actually uh, director of the School of Human Development and Organizational Studies at uh, the University of Florida, and I'm also a professor in research and evaluation methods. Thanks, David, and hi, everyone. I'm Tammy Cumming. I'm Associate Provost uh, at Brooklyn College of the City University of New York. I'm also an Iowa PhD graduate, so it is a huge honor to introduce our guest today, Lan Samantha Chang, who's the Program Director of the University of Iowa Writers' Workshop, and Elizabeth M. Stanley Professor of the Arts and of course, an award-winning author. Thank you so much for joining us today. To get, to get I, I'm delighted to be here. Thank you so much. Um, to get started, for those not familiar, and I don't think there's hardly anyone who wouldn't be, if you could talk a little bit about the Iowa Writers Workshop. Sure, the Iowa Writers Workshop is actually a two-year MFA program. It's a graduate program in creative writing. Uh, it was established in 1936. It's the first, making it the first MFA program in creative writing to sort of lead the way um, in that field in the U.S. and actually now in Great Britain and other countries. Uh, the University of Iowa started the program with an interest in, I believe, awarding credit for creative work and thinking that um, a thesis in poetry or fiction um, was worthy academic pursuit. So over the years, the program has evolved um, only somewhat. Uh, it has graduated a number of really extraordinary alums, including um, Flannery O'Connor, James Allen McPherson, uh, John Irving, Sandra Cisneros, Joy Harjo, um, you know, a number of Poets Laureate and, uh, you know, many, many Pulitzer Prize winning authors. So, um, you know, when I inherited the job of being director of the workshop in 2006, I was, I believe I'm only the sixth director of the program, uh, which is almost 90 years old at this point. Um, and, I felt that in some ways my job was to be a, you know, a, a nurturer of writers, um, a steward of a great program and a protector of this program. Um, you know, we're, we're at a time now with a great deal of change in higher education. And I think our program has changed a great deal under my directorship, but in many ways, I think we stick to, um, focusing on what matters to us, which is, um, you know, finding and bringing to Iowa really strong writers and giving them two years in which to develop their craft with excellent faculty in a supportive community. Um, I think that during my time at the program, I've worked really hard to bring financial aid up to a point where students are um, getting guaranteed funding, um, full tuition and stipends or teaching fellowships. The, uh, the other thing that has happened during my time as director is that we've become a much more diverse uh, program in, in different ways, I think, um, diverse in different ways. Yeah. So yeah, that's some of this. This is a small uh, description of, of the program and what we've been up to. Great, great. It sounds like, uh, you know, I'm I'm always impressed by the writers and things that have come out of that program. And so I know you have a lot of talent in that program. And um, one of the things, of course, is that that uh, would be of, of great interest to me and, and I think to our listeners is that, that I, I mean, I'm in a quantitative methods program. We're getting some quantitative test scores to see whether or not I've got the right people entering our program is very important. Uh, and so what I'd just love to hear a little bit from you about is, is how do you go about making sure that you have 
strong talent coming into your program and 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 what kinds of ways do you do you go about identifying people who will do well in the program? That's so interesting that you work in quantitative um, methods because our our way of finding people for the program involves very little that's quantitative, although there is a vote and we do count. So I'll talk about how we get to that vote and then how the vote works. Uh, I think that I should say here that I don't know very much about the poetry side of admissions, which is run entirely by poetry faculty. In that in that process, they read all of the poetry applications, which is you know maybe four hundred poetry applications to the program, and then they break them down into categories and discuss them in a committee meeting, and then they sort of just decide who is in, and. Um, in fiction, however, because there's so much reading involved, because there uh, are so many pages, like sheer number of words require that we use first readers. And the first readers that um, we use for fiction used to be students. We, um, When I was in the program in the 90s, uh, students, as part of their financial aid, would read admissions. Um, it's a tremendous amount of work um, to do this. And as time has gone on, we've tried to free up more time for the students by sort of uh, hiring um, recent graduates who are still very close to the program to do the first reads. Now, what we ask them to look for is hard to describe, but I will try to do it here. Um, they know how important it is. And they also have had very recently this experience of being students in the program. So I asked them, um, would you want to be in class with this writer? Like, would you want to read this writer's work? Does it excite you? Would this add something to a conversation in a classroom like the classrooms that you've been in? Um, and that that is, you know, a question that they often think about. But my my actual way of thinking about it is uh, to describe the process of reading. Um, say you're reading 200 manuscripts or maybe, um, and yeah, 200. I just, I'm just going to use this number. It's not, it's not necessarily indicative of how many they read, but it, it's a good enough amount so that you'll understand. You could read through 20 manuscripts that are often quite competent um, and then and and you're reading all the way through because we ask them to read all the way through and to write summaries of the of the work you read and suddenly you find something that that gives you that feeling that um, that Emily Dickinson said she encounters what she she has when she encounters real poetry, which is the top of her head is taken off. Now, I haven't been one of these readers as a as a student and also having read now for many, many years. Um, I know that feeling and it is a feeling that can't quite be quantified, but you know when you feel it. It's like when you read something that's very strong, you know, you've read it. Um. You know, I read what they write. I read their comments and I will read the I will read every manuscript to a certain point if I am agreeing with the comments and and um they're saying this person isn't ready. I and I will start and if I think that doesn't feel like it's ready, I will, you know, continue on in the pile. But there's always like hundreds of manuscripts um, that I have to read like basically through to figure out whether they belong in the next group of manuscripts. Um, when I'm doing that, uh, one thing I've noticed, I mean, sort of fascinating, there are trends in fiction manuscripts, like one year, everyone, no, I would say like 12 people wrote stories about yetis, you know, out of the thousand that we received, there were many stories about yetis that year, or sometimes the word nipple would come up repeatedly that year. And I would think, what is happening in our popular culture, you know, to, to make this, you know, happen. Um, but as I, as I'm looking through these manuscripts, I, I have noticed that there are sort of ways that people um, stand out uh, as writers that vary from year to year. Um, their, their trends and, and styles. And that's something that I also keep track of. Um, what I'm doing is I'm searching through the thousand manuscripts for 50 or 60 manuscripts that I think I can pass on to the faculty um, for the vote. 
And, um, you know, that's always, a, that's my favorite part of my job. Super exciting process. Uh, there's like a tension in the, in the prose. There's competence. Uh, I, I mean, I would say that, you know, in assessing like competence is, is key, although it is not the only thing we're looking for. Um, but, but there's a sense of, of a, of a writer, a, a voice, a human being on the other side of the page, like a, a sense that um, there's a certain kind of uh, just tension, okay. pressure. And mm -hmm. and when I find these manuscripts, and it takes me quite a while uh, to sort down to 50 or 60, um, you know, it is really, uh, that is a stage at which I don't really look at their applications. I mean, maybe for the last 10 or so, like I'll, I'll find maybe 40 that are so strong that I don't really need to find out anything, but maybe I'll have 30 manuscripts at the end for 10 spots. This is quite typical. And at that point, I might look to see, you know, what kind of, what kind of uh, profile this, this person has, you know, have they had a job before or after college? Um do they have letters of recommendation? Did they fill out, you know, just, you know, no. things. I mean, I will look at their applications at that point, but we do not require standardized tests. Um, we do not require, uh, you know, any information about their financial situation. Um, you know, I don't at this point generally look at their grades. Um, what, I, what we're really interested in is, in, is their writing. And if a teacher will say this person, um, is a good student and can learn and has learned an enormous amount. That's something that counts with me. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I choose the 50 and then those 50 manuscripts go to the faculty and the faculty read them. We'll say one thing about our admissions process is that we um, allow more pages than the average MFA program. We um, require that people hand in two, two pieces of work or more um, our page count is higher. Um, there are many, many programs that only require one story. And I feel like any anybody can sort of polish a story within an inch of its life, but can you do two? Um, and, and the other thing is that we're looking for something more than competence, which I know I brought up already, but a spark of excitement in the reader, you know, that's what we're really looking for. Um, competence the, you know, there are many, many writers of competent work. Mm -hmm. uh, so once we get to that point, the faculty vote, they vote for 20 each. Our class is 25 in fiction. And each each faculty member gets what I call passion pick. So if they read some some work and they think it's extraordinary, but they're not sure everyone else is going to get it, or they just want to make sure this person gets in, they have this one person that they can just say, I want this person. For, mm -hmm. for my passion pick. And then I will let them in, so, regardless of who else voted for them. After that, it's all according to the vote. That, that's that's fascinating to me. I'm As I listen to that, I've been in the world of assessment so long uh, that that I, I start hearing many elements that we've adapted in public school and in, in, in measuring writing assessment. You know, I mean, I hear you. Oh, that's so interesting. Yeah, I, I hear your holistic uh, assessments. I hear you, the idea that you're using multiple raters, which we know leads to greater reliability. Well, I, yeah, I, that's interesting. There are just lots of things you're doing at a very, uh, in, in my opinion, a very refined level and similar to what we do in graduate programs where we say, do you want to work with this student? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> But so, there's one other thing I have to add that we try to have a class of 26 in fiction because apparently one out of one out of 52 is where you get um how do you say uh outliers and mm -hmm. since we're a two year program that means we have 52 people in fiction at all times and one of them I assume is an outlier. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. That's I it. find this conversation very exciting because as as David just mentioned a lot of what I'm hearing, it actually sounds like you have a, a great system and it really depends on the context of the field and the discipline, but it seems like it's it's pretty well defined and we work with um, different levels of assessment across the nation. People will ask us, oh, how do we do this here or there? Sounds like you have a pretty sophisticated 
actually system in place from what I can hear. I, think I will good. add that the first readers, uh, each manuscript is read by two first readers. So I like to think that by the time someone's been rejected, they've been read by three people, including me, no offense to anyone, my karma is terrible. And then by the time they've been accepted or if they're a finalist, they've been read by seven readers because that includes our faculty. Um, not, not only have they been read by seven readers, but one of the things that I've uh, used in my generalizability analyses of statewide assessments, where they're using open-ended kinds of assessments, is you're also using more than one piece of work. Yeah. And, and that's a great strength in assessment practice, we consider that. Oh, that's so interesting. I mean, if somebody only turns in one piece, um, someone from the office will write an email to them and say, you need to turn in another piece in order to be considered. Yeah. You're one of our examples of best practices in assessment now, because these are really great things that you're doing um, at Iowa. Cool. I'm so thrilled. I can't wait to tell my boss. <laughs> I'm going to pivot just a little. So it, it sounds you you're doing so much already, and it's evidenced with the outcomes of your program. Your students are fantastic. The program is well regarded and respected. Um, accreditation standards are getting a little more prescriptive now. And they're saying you have to do certain assessment work. You need to look at diversity, equity, and inclusion. I, I would love to hear your opinion when, I, when I'm, uh, what I'm talking about has, has an impact in your program. But what I've already heard is you have a lot of fairness going on already. Um, especially with seven reads and multiple bodies of work. But I'd like to hear your response to accreditors getting involved to try to help level the playing field, particularly with respect to DEI or diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, accreditors, like professional accreditors? So, uh, accreditors that um, enable a university to confer their degrees, award financial oh. So that responsibility that every university has to go through every like eight or 10 years. Oh, that's so interesting. I mean, in a way, the results of our program speak for itself. And when we've had external reviewers, I mean, we're technically part of English. And so when they review English, they'll look at us. They have said that something along those lines. Um, I think that... It's, I think assessment in the arts in the, in, is, is very, very tricky, particularly in an art like writing that doesn't involve something like the ability to play a three octave A minor scale, you know? Mm -hmm. um, by the time the students have reached the program, we're confident that all of them have a great deal of potential. What we can't do as professors, you know, and what I can't do as an administrator is to create like, is to sort of push a button that will bring that student to the place where they need to be to flower exactly when we want them to. And what we're really wanting them to do is to is to reach their high as high a potential as they can possibly reach. But we can't control their ability to do that in this particular two years. So what we try to do is to provide them with like coursework and professors and um, sort of a really strong peer group that will inspire them and change them and make them more capable of when they're ready, um, creating their best possible work. And there are people who've been to our program and haven't published a book for until 10 years after they graduate. And then they will publish a book and I could name names, but it feels complicated. <laughs> But the, when they publish that book 10 or 12 years after they graduate, the book achieves external markers of success, which I have problems with this. But, you know, things such as, um, you know, book publication itself is an external marker and then prizes and, and fellowships are external markers and, um, you know, various things like NEA grants and um, bestseller lists are also external markers. But I, I mean, I think that I... I have trouble with that, but but I do think that the real the real issue is that I don't believe that somebody can put into words what a student is learning when they're enrolled in our program. 
I mean, so I, the idea of, an, say, an external assessor coming in and trying to assess what the students are learning is very strange to me and feels very foreign to the way that our program works, which is to immerse students in the most create, you know, creatively sort of rich environment possible and then to let them do what they can do at that time in their lives. Sure, we take attendance in workshop, for example. We um, we have, you know, meeting where at the end of the first year, all of the faculty read uh, work, at least two things from each student that they've accomplished in order to assess that they, you know, are still uh, making good progress in the program. But we understand that creative work is not sort of like a, uh, it's not linear. Progress is not linear. Progress is loopy. And, um, it's, it's, you know, um, I would say inspiration comes like when a person seems to be doing badly. And so what we do is we read the work, um, two pieces from each student in fiction, and we just talk about the student's strengths and weaknesses and think about ways that we as faculty could help um, them. And then we kind of figure out like, whether they're okay, but we're not worried about whether they're okay as writers. We want to make sure that they're flourishing in the program and that they feel okay. Yeah. Um, so that's sort of where we are with, with that. We don't assess um, the grades are in the workshop are pass fail. <laughs> mm -hmm. That makes good sense actually. And I For our situation, yeah. Yeah, I didn't mean to imply most accreditors will not say you have to have an external body reviewing the quality of your program, but at least an internal discussion, like are we getting our students, you know, through giving them the instruction that they need, but it sounds like you're doing so much of that. And again, as I'm listening to you talk about the way you operate your program and the faculty discussions and touching base on how the students are doing and that growth comes from when they're struggling, those are all um, part, part of the main point of assessment. We're using that term and it sounds so formal, but it really is just keeping, you know, monitoring the progress of the students, making sure that students are admitted that are likely to flourish in the program, et cetera. Yeah, to say on but we team. have a thesis. The student is required to turn in a thesis. So for poetry, it's a quote book length work of poetry and for fiction, it's, you know, 70 or 80 pages plus of polished fiction. And they work with one of the faculty members in their final semester um, on their thesis. They have an advisor and that person, that a lot of that work happens. Um, you know, their culminating work in the program happens on their thesis. But we also see the thesis as a snapshot of where they are at the, in their development when they're in the program. Like there are many writers, again, I won't name names, who've come through the program and done incredibly well with their thesis. Like they've gotten to be a Pulitzer finalist basically by publishing their thesis. But there are just as many or more writers who come through the program and become like quite, you know, accomplished as writers. But when you go back, if you were to go to the library and look to see the thesis, which is available to the public, you would see that what they were working on in the program was entirely different from what they were working on when they sort of developed and published. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's all. Uh, it sounds like you're doing a lot of interesting and good work there. Well, let me ask one last question, and that is, uh, you mentioned at the beginning that you've got a very diverse group there. That that's always a tough one to keep up, and and I'm just wondering, do you do specific things, or are there specific uh, kinds of uh, activities from admissions through graduation that you do to make sure that you keep up that diversity, or is it just a natural thing that happens given the type of program that you have? I mean, I think some of both, but what we've done since 2017 is we have had a couple of visits to um, historically black colleges and universities where we have worked with their uh, students and alums and their English departments to present um, like information about our program to work with their students in their creative writing classes and then to have like group 
events, um, readings. Uh, last year we were at the um, consortium in Atlanta. Uh, and then we've also been to Howard and um, it was, it's always super exciting for our students to work with um, interested undergraduates. I would say that what's most important, there are two, there are two ways I think that we work on diversity in our program. The first way is to encourage uh, people to apply because in order for us to have a strong program, we have to have a strong pool of applicants. Um, so outreach is part of that and just sort of word of mouth is part of that. And then also because we have a lot of students publishing really wonderful work, um, students from a variety of uh, backgrounds and cultures, and um, the, they put the, they add, you know, we don't ask them to, but a lot of them add that they were graduates of this program into their bios. And I think that that encourages young interested writers to apply to the program. So that's one way, that's another way we keep our applicant pool up. But the other um, thing that I think is that I strongly believe that what makes a program work is to create a community, a supportive community. And I, it, that just sounds so vague, but um, I think it begins in the classroom um, I was told when I started the program by one of my mentors that I could change the program by like creating a, a, a good classroom environment. Mm -hmm. And I've tried to do that. I'm not always like a hundred percent successful, but I, I try very hard to make the classroom open and as encouraging as possible. And, but also fair so that some people don't get to talk all the time. And, you know, the work is, is looked at on its own merits and, and people are trying to be as honest as possible. Um, I think that that goes a long way. I think the students can feel when your attitude is positive and, and when you try to be supportive and you're willing to hear them. Um, I think that matters enormously. I feel though that the students in our programs themselves do so much to create a supportive community for each other. Um, and for the incoming students that we have been quite lucky in our ability to attract and, you know, matriculate and graduate really wonderful writers. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. I just sure. can't really appreciate the, your time taking to speak with us about this important topic and about your program, learning more about it and the great work that you're doing there. While we have you here, I do, I have to ask, is there a particular book right now that you're reading that you just can't put down? Oh, wow. Um, okay, just right now, um, tomorrow, one of my former students, Derek Neuro, is publishing a book called What Napoleon Could Not Do um, with Riverhead. That's a really wonderful book about America and Ghana. And, you know, I... I would say since it's it's coming out tomorrow that this is like something I mentioned. <laughs> good, good. Well, thank you so much. Yes. Sure. Yes, thank you. It's been a pleasure talking to you.